Okay, so hello and welcome back to another Unity tutorial. In this video, I'm going to be showing you some of the code behind Dappertools. If you've not used my package already, then I've put it on GitHub down below. You can go get it. I've made a video. My previous video about Unity was actually explaining how to essentially use it and showing you some of the stuff I already made at that time. But since then, I've worked on it some more and I'm going to keep working on it more when I have time. One of the things I've made so far is really cool. I want to show you guys. So let's get into that now. But of course, first I've got to thank my patrons, a special thanks to Some Hobo 101, Flow State Games, Average Morning, Luke Latham, Hades Zorko, Rene, Evgeny, Art Farrell, Budaray, and Memory Baldwin. If anyone else is able to help support the channel monetarily, the link to my patrons down below. If not, there are also links down below to social media, such as Twitch, Twitter, and Discord. If you could help me out by following on any of those, it'd be greatly appreciated. Let's get to the video. Okay, so in this window, I have my Dapper Tools project, and over here, I've got my actual game where I'm messing around with my tools. So like a game where I'm actually using the tools. Now this project is private, but this one is public. The actual Dapper Tools you can get, uh, I showed you in the last video how to do that. So what I wanna show you is this input wrapper I've made. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is it in action, and then I'll explain how it works and how you might wanna use it. And then obviously feel free guys to give me feedback below how I should change it, you know, fix bugs if you've noticed any bugs with it, whatever, right? Give all the feedback down below, or even on GitHub. Now. What happens is uh, I'm mixing my new input system with the state machine. So first of all, just showing you what happens. Uh, I've got the game on my other screen, but it's fine because you can see it in the scene view here. So notice how, um, if I just free my cursor, you notice how I'm in state idle, right? I've got the player has a state machine and state idle. If I jump, I go rising and then I go falling, then I'm back to idle. Moving, I haven't got like a moving state yet. That's just idle, right? Idle can move. If I jump, I come down, jump, come down, jump, come down. Now that's the state machine. Uh, obviously I can expand on that. I've just made some simple states, but notice how the way I get input, if I go to my idle state where I've got moving, um, I have this thing called an input receiver, which then basically has a list of all the things it cares about, all the different inputs. And then it has events that it raises just like the normal Unity, like new input system does. Um, but I use my own and the reason is because I've thought for a while about input in different games that I've been trying to make and the one thing that's really annoyed me is the fact that in certain states or certain scenarios you want to be able to um, have input for something but then in other states you don't want that input and it's hard to just or it's very awkward to just go around putting loads of if checks oh if I am doing this then don't take this input if this do that da, da. in my opinion scripts themselves that do stuff like moving should not take input it's not their job to take input right single responsibility principle so I designed an input system that handles all input and I can feed that input into scripts that don't know anything about input and then they still work so if we actually go look at this uh, movement input behavior this one yeah it's about input but it doesn't actually do with the, any any of the input taking itself. Uh, obviously, I have an open Visual Studio, so just give me a minute. I'll skip ahead. Okay, so this is one of the scripts that I've written in my game. I've been trying to separate out mono behaviors from actual logic. So anything that doesn't need to be a mono behavior, I've put into a normal class. So here's the movement input class. And all it does is it has a move function where it takes an vector two, and it basically works out based on the camera angle and stuff, which way to move um, because it's moving relative. And basically that's it. Uh, I'm also using some of the extension functions that I've got in here. So rather than saying equals a new thingy and setting the X and setting the Y, if it's just this value, but the Y should be zero, I'd say dot change Y zero. And I could even then follow up by saying uh, dot change whatever. I can just, you know, do those things. It's quite easy actually. Because uh, internally what it does is it makes a new struct for you. It just saves some typing. It's, it's really easy for the extension methods. But essentially um, this script handles movement, but it gets the input not in itself. It gets this input passed in. Um, now the main benefit to this is you'll have scenarios in games thinking of like Overwatch. You might have the character Junkrat where your ultimate summons a rip tire, which is, you know, a thing you can control with movement. But when you're controlling rip tire, you can't move Junkrat. You've essentially got something else now with a higher priority taking movement input. And then once uh, the, junk, uh, the rip tire dies, sorry, Junkrat gets his input back because that thing's gone now. And it's the same with a lot of things in, in games. You might, for example, um, use WASD to move and then when you go into a you know dialogue WASD is now to interact with the dialogue or a puzzle or something or even um, interacting might be E but then once you've interacted with something maybe you don't want to be able to you know press E again but you don't want like an if check it's a bit awkward so the way I've made this work I'll have to go over to um, go over to the other project Dapper Tools so if I go to my scripts well the Dapper Tools runtime scripts and go to uh, components, input. Okay, so input has all these different things, but there's actually not that much code for it. Um, 
we can open the input value. Obviously, yeah, it's another project, so it's going to open it in a new Visual Studio window. But essentially, we have an input manager that just sits in the scene. It's not a singleton. Don't don't get confused with singletons. I hate singletons. Don't use them. Uh, there's always a better way around singletons, pretty much. Um, I have not had a scenario in a long time since I found out better ways to deal with singletons. I've never had to use them since. But we have the input manager at the root of it all. And how it works is that this is using the new Unity input system, keep in mind, right? Um, we have the input action asset, which is the thing you make with your controls. So if you guys have used the new Unity input system, you'll remember you can go create uh, input actions and you get this asset here where you can make controls, okay? So once you've done this, every control you make actually has its own asset. So the way I can show you this is by going to my actual project where I've used it. So if I go over to here, assets, input, I've got my input controls here. I've got movement, look, jump, all these different things. Inside here, we've actually got these uh, action references. And I thought that was pretty interesting. So what I've got ahead of done is I've made a scriptable object for axis and a scriptable object for actions. So all input is either an axis or an action, at least <laughs> as far as I can think. So you either have like jumping, shooting, which are actions, or you've got movement and looking, which is an axis. Um, so for example, jump, jump is an action, but look and movement are both axes. So in here, I've got an axis and a, an axis and an actions folder, and there's one action, two axes, and these are scriptable objects that I've made. That what they do is they take in an input action reference, so it's the thing that I just showed you, right? With the um, inside the controls, there's actually that drop down box with all the different scriptable object things, the, the action references. So here it is. You pass it in. And when you ask this scriptable object to get its value, it reads it as a vector two. And then if it, that's for an axis, then if it's for an action, it works slightly differently. Um, if it's for an action, input action, then what it does is it says input action dot action dot triggered, bool, true or false, whether the action was triggered. Okay, so that's how we actually take input. So back in the manager, I'm sorry if this is really confusing guys, there's a reason I wrote it and put it in a package so you guys can use it, but, um, we have a list of those axes and a list of those actions. So you, uh, over here in your input manager, you pass them in. So I'm saying in my game, the two axes I want to take input for is movement and look, and then the uh, action is jump. Now, normally you might think, oh, why don't I just make my input manager hard code it and read from my uh, asset? The problem is if it's hard coded, then multiple people can't use it, right? I want this to be usable for everyone. So I made it in a generic way where anyone can use it, all you have to do manually really is just make scriptable object instances for each of your different axes and movements and stuff and then just drag them into here and then they work and then over here for example where i want to move in my idle state the input receiver you drag in the same scriptable object reference to say this is an axis i care about so if you you see how this input receiver has a priority of zero if i added another input receiver that has a higher priority and it wants the same axis or the same action then what happens is the one with the higher priority gets told that yes you jumped or this is the movement but the ones with a lower priority don't get told that now the way this works okay is update we handle input we say get input data we fill the axis values so we have a dictionary in here a dictionary of um input axis to input values of vector two and an input action of input values bool so i made this struct where you is a type struct so you can have bool and vector two right um and it has a boolean for whether it's been handled. And by default, that's false. It hasn't been handled. As soon as it's handled, so as soon as someone requests the value, so as soon as you say dot value, we say, if we've already been handled, return default. So for a vector two, that's zero, zero. And for a boolean, it's false, right? The default value. And then we set handled to be true. Otherwise, we return the value. So the, basically, the first person to ask for the value gets it, and everyone else doesn't get it. So when we have this priority thing, we give this to the thing with the highest priority. It reads it. And then if it reads it, uh, the things below it that try reading it actually just get the default value rather than the actual value. And that's essentially how the whole thing works. Then the hard part was thinking, all right, how do I actually get this all passed around? So we have a static function um, somewhere to add and remove a receiver. When we add a receiver, we add it in um, priority order. When we remove, it doesn't matter, you just remove it. And so we always have a list of input receivers in priority order. And then every frame, once we've got the input filled in, so obviously we fill it in in the dictionary here, right? We read the values like I showed you earlier in the scriptable objects. Um, we set it back to this dictionary and then every frame, we make a new instance of this struct input data, which stores the dictionaries. So every frame, this dic these two dictionaries have all the axes and all the correct values every frame. And then anyone that wants, so these, this input data is then passed 
to every receiver, and it's in order, priority order, and they all get to process it. So each uh, receiver will process, it'll say for all axes that I care about, basically uh, read the axis. But remember, when we say dot value, wherever that is, um, oh, is it just dot axis? No, I'm uh, being silly, where is it? Process input. Yeah. Um, dot get axis. So here when we say dot get axis, we try get value out of the dictionary. Value dot value, I could probably name that better, but get the value for the axis. And then um, we set it back because it's a struct, it's by uh, value rather than reference. So if we didn't set it back, it would actually be wrong. It wouldn't work. If we don't set it back, then actually everyone that asks gets the right input, but we want it to stop. So as soon as we've read the value, we set it back. Okay. So if something goes wrong, then we just say back to 2.0 or false. But yeah, it works for actions as well. We say get action, go get the actions value. Remember when we ask for value, if we're the first person to do it, then or if we're the first receiver to do it, then we get it, otherwise we don't. Okay, now I haven't actually shown the priority thing happening uh, in the scene, but essentially what we can do now, we have this state idle, I care about movement input and I move. But let's make an empty game object, okay? That has a receiver, right? This has an input receiver. And I'm gonna say it has a higher priority than the player, so 100, could be anything higher. And I want to care about movement, right? So I'm going to care about the movement axis. And I'm not going to do anything, right? I'm just going to say I care about the movement axis. And because I have a higher priority than the player, I will get the movement input, not the player. So if I uh, turn this game object off and press play, what happens is I can move. You see, I can move. But as soon as I enable this game object and I try moving, I can't move anymore. Because all the input, uh, what's happening is this input receiver here is actually reading the value for movement. Because it's reading it, it's setting handle to true. Then when it gets to idle next, because it's a lower priority, what happens is when I try and read this movement, it's actually becoming zero, zero because it's uh, already been read. So now this thing has higher priority. So you can imagine if this also could move, then this would move instead. As soon as this dies and goes away out of the scene, I can move again. I'm freed up because that thing's gone from the list. So. I think it re it works really well. It does mean that like you can, for example, um, have a spell that summons something in the scene, like a little pet that you can control, and when it dies, you uh, get your control back. You could do it like that. It's really easy. So, yeah, this video obviously wasn't too long. If you want to actually look through all the code, then obviously it's on Dapper Tools. You can get it on GitHub. Give me any suggestions or ways to improve this, or how you think it might not work in your game, and I can try and make it work in you know every game as long as using the new input system. I don't see why it wouldn't. Uh, but yeah. Feel free to let me know down below everything. If you like the video, then leave a like and subscribe. I know it was a short one than normal, but I was just showing you something that I'd been making and I want to hear your feedback about it. So yeah, uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time and goodbye.